top their group, but Manchester United must wait until the final round to know their fate. Yes, they must, because Fred saw red as PSG beat Oli's men at Old Trafford, lining up a showdown with Leipzig in the final match week for United. The Charlie Bard watches at the Emirates for us nice and early ahead of Arsenal's game in the Europa League tonight, but she'll also be talking about the small matter of the North London derby this Sunday. Yeah, big game indeed. Now it's also Chelsea versus Leeds this weekend. Ian Hervin is rolling back the years at Ellen Road with a man who knows a little bit about this fixture. Yeah, and that game is the inspiration for our <laughs> social media topic today. We're looking for your favourite fixtures that aren't the obvious mm. ones. So no derbies. Liverpool against Newcastle, a good example. Arsenal oh, against United, Manchester. You, United, me, yeah? uh, <laughs> you know, the, the fixtures that when the fixture list comes out, mm. once you've put aside the derbies, the ones you really look forward to, hashtag PL fans on Twitter and read the best of them out on the show later. Yes, we will. Now, earlier we were talking about our teams in the Champions League. Well, it was good fortunes for one and not so good fortunes for the other. As you can see there, Sevilla lost at home to Chelsea. Olivia Giroud there with four goals. And uh, Manchester United losing at Old Trafford to PSG 3-1 as well. They still got a little bit of work to do to make the uh, qualifying stages uh, for the group stage. And we're going to start with Manchester United with our first guest, Philip Kudryavtsev from Rambler TV in Moscow. Philip, uh, you can mm. describe this performance in many ways, but how disappointing was it for the Manchester United fans, do you think? Hi there, thanks for having me. Well, first of all, I would say I would focus on positives and I would say that it was a really good game from Manchester United and really good approach from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. I suppose that uh, almost every choice he picked was uh, was good. Uh, but, well, I've actually watched the game with a Manchester United fan and he said that actually, uh, surprisingly, it was a very good game, uh, one of one of one of uh, one of few uh, very good games that Manchester United actually didn't win. Uh, so I would describe it as an unlucky, and I suppose uh, Man United can be proud of yourself, uh, well, as a whole. Well, a lot of people on social media, and even we were talking about it in the in the office this morning, was thinking, why didn't he take off Fred at half time? Is that inexperience? I mean, what do you put that to? I can't explain it. I can't actually explain it because, well, the minute he stepped on Paredes' foot and he um, somehow, uh, somehow wasn't sent off uh, that time, uh, well, this very minute we actually um, exchanged opinions and everybody told that yes, uh, he should have come off. Uh, well, there was, uh, well, he was actually actually very lucky. He um, didn't uh, receive a. Uh, red card uh, in the first episode when he uh, had a brawl with uh, Paredes in the center of the pitch. Uh, then was this, uh, this incident and well, you could really see that uh, Fred wasn't calm. Actually, after uh, after each episode, he was furious. He wanted to chat with the players. He wanted to argue with the referee. So there was every sign for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for him to, 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 to take him off. Let's move on uh, from Manchester United to Chelsea. Completely mm, different mm. Uh, feeling around their performance last night. And one man was the star of the show, Olivier Giroud. And I find him, Philip, a really interesting topic because he's played for Arsenal and Chelsea. He's played for top clubs in the Premier League. But he just doesn't seem to be fancied by managers as a starting striker too often, particularly in the Premier League. But when he plays, he scores, doesn't he? Uh, well, he's favoured by one of the managers. And it's Didier Deschamps. Uh, who always makes him the first choice uh, striker and he always scores for him. And I suppose that is the question. Well, Giroud is now 34, we shouldn't forget it. Uh, so there is, a, there is a very, very tough choice for Frank Lampard because Giroud really scores every time he's on the pitch. But I suppose maybe he actually receives uh, the uh, exact amount of time he needs to score. Maybe he doesn't need more. Maybe he does, but a little more. Uh, and, well, he's not uh, the first uh, choice option for a reason. I suppose that there is a good balance right now because Timo Werner, uh, both Timo Werner and uh, Tammy Abraham, they do get their goals. And they're kind of the future of Chelsea. Uh, so it would be very hard now for Abraham uh, to be a sub under Olivier Giroud each time, well, uh, week, week in and week out. Uh, but for Olivier Giroud just to have these moments for himself and have this extra motivation, maybe it is in his favor. So 
I, I can't tell for sure, but I suppose Frank Lampard thinks in some 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 uh, some way that it's similar to to my thoughts. Yeah, but I guess this gives Lampard quite a good problem, really, because they've got so many attacking options at Chelsea at this moment in time. Yeah, of course. Of course. And, uh, well, there are different attacking options. Uh, I suppose that uh, Timo Werner and Tammy Abraham is the uh, first choice partnership, of course. And Olivier Giroud, when you need his physical presence uh, in the... Um, uh, when, you have, uh, when you need his physical presence... Uh, in the box, in the opposition box, so when you need him uh, to be fresh uh, after a, a sequence of games, well, he's there and he's always there and he's ready to help. That's what very, very few uh, squads uh, in the Premier League have. OK, Philip, stay with us. We'll be back with you in just a little while to talk more football. But I tell you what, a team that could use a striker like Olivier Giroud is Arsenal. And Vizali Bardwaj is out and about talking to someone about some of the issues facing Mikel Arteta and his Arsenal squad. Yes, absolutely. I am joined by Sam Dean, who writes for The Telegraph here at the Emirates Stadium. We're here nice and early. Arsenal, of course, are in action later on today. They take on Rapid Vienna in the Europa League. But Sam, Arsenal are already through. So how many changes do you think we can expect from Mikel Arteta tonight? Uh, quite a lot, I think. Uh, we've seen in the last few weeks in the Europa League how keen Arteta is to rotate and give mm -hmm. some of his fringe players a chance. And as you say, they're already through and you'd expect up to eight or nine, if not a full team changing tonight, particularly with Spurs coming on the weekend. But it's a good chance for those guys to, to show their quality and to sort of maybe edge their way into the team for the Sunday because, as we know, Arsenal's form isn't great. So a hat-trick tonight for someone, that might be enough to get them in the Premier League team again. Now, we'll get on to the North London derby shortly, but you were here at the weekend when Arsenal lost to Wolves. And, you know, they've lost five Premier League games already this season, uh, three in their last five, and all three of those defeats have come here at the Emirates Stadium. I mean, how much pressure is Mikel Arteta currently under? Well, it's hard to say a bit because, obviously, the fans are getting a bit unhappy from what we know on social media because they're not in the ground vocalising that unhappiness. But... Within the club, there's not much pressure on Arteta still. There's an acceptance that this guy needs a lot of time and he's inherited a project that really was disintegrating under Unai Emery before. And you look at his squad and it's been built by three or four different executives above him and it's all mismatched and unbalanced and he needs time to fix that. And I think there's an acceptance that he will. But obviously the issue is results, it's results game. If he loses five games in a row, then obviously the pressure will mount. But for now, he won the FA Cup. I wasn't so long ago, remember. He instantly lifted the team when he came in last December. So there's plenty of sort of goodwill in the bank around him. And the way he communicates and the way he lifted the club, there's plenty of time left for Mikel. And of course, you mentioned it there. They do have a tough next game in the Premier League. It is a way to Tottenham. Tottenham, of course, lead the Premier League standings. They've got the best defence in the league. They're scoring uh, plenty of goals, bar that a goalless draw against Chelsea. Uh, Arsenal, meanwhile, they are conceding goals. You know, they're not creating enough chances, certainly. Um, so are Spurs the clear favourites going into that match? Or do you think form sometimes goes out of the window when it comes to a derby game? History shows that form goes out the window, but you would still say that Spurs are the likely winners here. What will be very interesting is to see how Jose Mourinho approaches it because mm. the one thing we know about Arsenal is that they're deadly on the counter-attack and in recent weeks teams haven't let them do that. They've sat deep and said, go on then, break us down. If Mourinho wants to attack Arsenal, he might leave himself vulnerable and we know Mourinho over the years has always been reluctant to do that. So I expect both teams to be quite cagey. Arsenal might play a back five, Spurs might be quite reluctant to push forward. It could be a real nil-nil grind of a match, but then an early goal changes it. But, uh, but yeah, don't expect fireworks, I don't think. Now, one man who Spurs fans will be hoping does play is Harry Kane. He missed training yesterday. Jose Mourinho does think he will be fit to start that game. But it's interesting when you compare his stats to someone like Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. I mean, Kane has scored uh, seven goals. He's created nine others so far this season. But Aubameyang, he's scored just two goals and created one. Um, why do you think he's struggling so much at the moment? I think with Aubameyang, he has never been the sort of player who can score a goal on his own. You look sometimes at Kane, you can ping a ball into him, he'll control it, beat a defender and smash it in the top corner. Aubameyang is not that kind of player. He relies on the system and he relies on people helping him out. And with him, it needs to be working for him in terms of the players around him. Willian's not been delivering assists. Mm. Bakayo Saka has been trying his best but not quite there yet. Lacazette's been really struggling this year and Aubameyang needs that service, that's the way he plays and without that, and without the system really functioning, he's always going to struggle because he can't do it all on his own. Mm, well, we see whether or not Aubameyang does play today, whether or not he can get a goal, but it is an important game for Arsenal, uh, even if it is just 
to boost the confidence ahead of that North London Derby clash away to Tottenham this weekend.